a uh, very good morning so there is some issue yeah very good morning so we are here uh, into the third day of this conference raise 2020 which is the responsible ai for social empowerment uh, uh for last two days we have covered many of the important topics like ai in languages and that is very important for indian languages uh mapping the gis part of it financial services inclusive ai digital platform and ai in education uh bid its inauguration by honorable prime minister when he conveyed his vision to make india as ai hub and then use ai for building next generation urban infrastructure and social empowerment a uh, very warm warm welcome to all the viewers and audience uh, ai influences our lives uh, in number of ways whether we want to filter the unwanted emails automatically recognizing the photographs of the friends using virtual assistants controlling air pollution or medical diagnostics we are still starting we are still in the beginning of it of ai evolution but in coming days ai is set to reshape societies industries job lives and it has potential to boost gdp to great extent to increase productivity and innovation ai offers an opportunity to improve human well-being making life easier healthier and longer so ai has given us number of technologies like computer vision nlp machine learning deep learning ar and vr which can be leveraged in the solution spanning from robotics to virtual agents to speech to identity analytics today we have with us the panelists from diverse fields to talk about building the right ecosystem to use ai is opportunities and challenges to foster data management innovation sport deployment at the scale to deliver high impact of ai in different sectors of economy sir we have uh, uh, the eminent panelist with us uh, mr sandeep patel who is a managing director of ibm india and south asia Uh, sir is handling all strategic and operational matters in ibm sales marketing services delivery operations in the region he enables india's capabilities across ibm global ventures sir will also be the keynote speaker and will be moderating the session we have a second panelist mr ranjan sharma who is cio of supply chain and e commerce in best seller india he heads it operations which include operational management strategic management warehouse op operations sap and erp he will be talking on ai enabled sap erp and putting them into business welcome mr sharma uh, then we have a panelist mr tarun agarwal who is executive vice president engineering in maruti limited he is a supply chain expert in automobile industry skilled in negotiation cost management financial feasibility global sourcing and legal negotiation and we will be delighted to know from him the use of ai in procurement and automobile and engineering services uh, we have another eminent panelist mr arvind shiva ramakrishnan who is cio of apollo hospital he is a digital transformation expert with lot of domain knowledge in healthcare strategy consulting of digital it enablement and transformation and we will be very glad all the audience will be glad to know about the work being done by apollo 
or work being planned by Apollo uh, in using AI in healthcare sector, which is very, very important sector. We are Ms. Salini Warrior, the Executive Director of Federal Bank. She has been driving the operation excellence and digital innovation in Federal Bank for a few years now. Uh, and we will be very glad to, uh, and she will be talking on personalized customer exposure services, fraud detection, and accelerated growth using AI in banking sector. We have another panelist, Lula Mohantiji. She is GM IBM, uh, uh, GM Asia Pacific. She is responsible for financial performance and successfully established the practice of global business services. And she will be highlighting the automated process, processes and services in that sector. And we have another eminent panelist, Mr. Anu Kumar Mahapatra, who is Deputy MD with SBI. He has led the management of employees' self services using IT systems and has a diverse banking experience of over 30 years. He will be talking on financial inclusion and taking the banking services to rural areas. So we have today, sir, a number of experts uh, uh, who caters to IT operations, supply chain, logistics, automobile, contract management, healthcare, banking. And I'm sure uh, the audience, the viewers will be highly benefited out of their expertise. I now request Mr. Sandeep Patel uh, to deliver his keynote address and then moderate the session, sir. Thank you, Mr. Thakur. Namaskar and good morning, everyone. Welcome to RACE 2020. In this session, we will delve on the opportunities that are presented by artificial intelligence and data, and more importantly, how we can leverage it for growth. I'm delighted to be here to speak to you and exchange my thoughts. Now, we have been talking about the potential and promise of artificial intelligence for a long time and in many platforms. So the question is, what makes it so relevant in the current context? I think one of the most significant aspects which has put artificial intelligence or AI at the center of all development conversations is our ability to harness large volumes of structured and unstructured data and apply AI to drive crucial insights. Till some time back, we were talking about the complexity and volume of data, but today, that data is here. And we also have solutions like quantum computers that can give access to high powered computing and help manage exponential data. Now, when we marry the two, the available data sets, which are exponentially growing, they are becoming increasingly ubiquitous and also readable by our computers and combine them with these computing tools that's when we can truly realize the potential of artificial intelligence and use it to solve some of the most complex problems faced by the world today. This makes our AI story very strong. And the timing could not be better to discuss and deliberate on its future, as this is truly the decade of artificial intelligence. We are at a critical inflection point. And going ahead, we will be witnessing the use of AI at scale given extreme digital acceleration. Several sectors across retail, finance, healthcare, e-commerce are already deploying AI to increase efficiency and productivity, enhance customer service, and build a strong security cover. And these digital transformation journeys have further accelerated in the wake of the COVID pandemic. As a result, the pace of digital acceleration compressed over a span of eight to 10 months is something that, we, that would have actually taken several years to happen. Today, we are speedily moving towards digital at scale where technologies are creating a socioeconomic environment that is far more connected, open, intelligent, and scalable. We are thriving in vast ecosystems that are broad by nature potentially spanning across multiple geographies and industries, including public and private institutions, as well as consumers. In many ways, I fundamentally believe that this digital revolution and these ecosystems that are forming, they are actually blurring the lines that we've traditionally seen across industries. 
And at the heart of these ecosystems lie technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning that are supporting decision-making and swiftly transforming our society. So there is no denying that data has become ubiquitous and we have access to large amounts of structured and unstructured data sets that weren't available before. More importantly, they are now readable by our computers. The next step which will define our winning edge is our ability and efficacy to harness this data, which means that right from gathering basic data to data curation, drawing descriptive and predictive analysis, hopefully leading to prescriptive an an analytics without negating the need and power of human intelligence. Essentially, every element of the entire data cycle calls for a well-defined approach. And while doing so, timing is going to be of great essence. When we are dealing with data today, hot or cold data, as we call it, the key will lie in harnessed real time. Else we risk, run the risk of losing relevance very, very quickly. A lot of data that is available today and is readable by our computers tends to lose relevance within a few nanoseconds after it's created. So the important uh, element and the important challenge is to harness that data curated and put it in context of enabling faster decision-making. The data is most powerful when we are able to apply it to our decision-making at scale and speed. And to achieve this, we need AI at scale. We need power like computer, uh, quantum computing and operationalizing of AI. Let me co contextualize this for you and showcase how all the references I just made come to life through a very small video about what is happening in our own agricultural sector here in the country. The video showcases where problem lies and what is being done to address it. Let's watch this video. and small businesses around the world. Timely and reliable weather information is critical for the success of enterprises and entire industries around the world. While high resolution, rapidly updating weather information exists for the US, Japan, and a handful of countries in Western Europe today, the rest of the world's weather forecasts are lower resolution or updated less frequently. This prevents large and small businesses around the world from reaching their potential. Rain that was expected to come in three months' time is coming in one month. So it causes flood. From last seven years, we have seen the pattern of rain and temperature variation is rampant over the years, have become largely unpredictable and surprising. So no more we are uh, following the historical trends of temperature variation. High accuracy weather data is, is very important, especially in large countries like India, where you don't have uh, very dense grids of automated weather stations. Most of the times uh, during monsoons, you have cloud cover and uh, satellite based information is not always complete. We don't have a single consistent spatial and temporal resolution at which we are able to get the necessary information which is required uh, from a weather parameter perspective at a global scale. IBM, the weather company, have created IBM Graph, global high-resolution atmospheric forecast system. By combining IBM's supercomputing power, IBM Graph will help close the global gap for access to timely and reliable weather information. It will increase the resolution of uh, our insights uh, because of the global high-resolution data sets that Graph is offering. If such uh, data is available in advance, Maybe we can plan different sorts of crops which can take care of these variations. It is a big challenge which farming community is facing today. Imagine the level of productivity, precision and the strength of decision making when a farmer has access to such wealth of information and tools 
to manage their challenges. And I'm not talking about piloting technologies. The Karnataka government has deployed this in five districts last year for tomato and corn crops, and it's using the insights drawn for further crop planning. And there are many examples across other industry verticals. AI is everywhere and it is pervasive. This reminds me uh, of a quote that our CEO Arvind Krishna made during our flagship uh, Think 2020 event. He said, every company will be an AI company, not because they can, but because they must. This is so true because we are witnessing artificial intelligence take on a more engaged role in every sector. Artificial intelligence today is acting as the first responder to COVID queries and supporting multilingual response mechanism for state governments. The Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR, and the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in the government of India has implemented a Watson Assistant, uh, which is built on its portal to respond to specific queries of front frontline staff and data entry operators from various testing facilities across the country. The national health mission under the government of Andhra Pradesh, on the other hand, has collaborated with us to make Watson Assistant for citizens available to its citizens with local language support as a part of the COVID-19 response efforts. Now, we just talked about how artificial intelligence has become a friend to the farmers. It is also supply, uh, supporting supply chains. Uh, the use of AI to help uh, many clients extract demand signals and model demand behavior, thus ensuring that the right products is available at the right place at the right time, and more importantly, at the right price. AI is also helping to build a future talent pipeline. Recently, I hosted some young school children. They, these are children who are uh, aged up to 15 years who have actually designed AI-driven applications and solutions to solve some of the most critical problems that are faced by us today. Thousands of students will be benefiting from the IBM AI curriculum introduced by CBSC in over 200 schools. So we are witnessing the use of AI in education, but it's not just AI in education. It is AI for education, as we are using AI now to train teachers, you know, conduct train the trainer courses and so on. Technology platforms such as AI powered by cloud have become the basis for competitive advantage in the 21st century as organizations across the world, they look for models that are agile, cost efficient and built on a foundation of trust. So whether it is profits or purpose, Artificial intelligence is a critical building block for the future of our nation and our society. However, in order to capitalize artificial intelligence to the fullest, it needs to be democratized, trusted, and open. Artificial intelligence is only as good as the data that you are using for it. And as, as there is a lot of work which is involved in tagging and classifying the data correctly. Um, I often say that there is no AI without IA, which is uh, organization of information. Therefore, the entire governance life cycle becomes very, very important. Furthermore, companies have to trust it, knowing that even after using AI, they will have full ownership and protection of their data and insights. Artificial intelligence must be fair, that is, free from bias, accountable, explainable, and secure. Finally, the openness is really important and key to driving continuous innovation. Until 2019, businesses were forced to use AI from the cloud provider hosting their data. Businesses can no longer afford AI that locks them into a single vendor's cloud and limits innovation. So in 2019, we put a stake in the ground and announced Watson Anywhere, a complete game changer. Organizations can now use Watson AI technologies to run on any cloud, IBM, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. And this allows businesses to bring artificial intelligence wherever their data and applications reside instead of the other way around. We encourage people to take it, use it and innovate on it. 
we don't see it as IBM's property alone. We see it as a contribution to the community to help clients be more successful. And this is what good tech is all about. It is also an element of responsible AI. AI is supporting several human and business functions. It is not just artificial intelligence. We have to think about it as augmented intelligence. So when we look at furthering the national growth agenda, it is impossible to ignore what we may be able to achieve with the implementation of AI. Artificial intelligence in my mind is one of the most powerful disruptions of our time and none of us can afford to be left behind. Greater adoption of AI can support financial inclusion, uh, infrastructure development, enhance farmer support, amplify health services, strengthen the academic and skilling ecosystem, and a lot more. Although we continue to face challenges like maturity of data, skill gaps, old infrastructure, trust and explainability of AI, it is encouraging to see that there is a def definite shift towards wide ranging implementations where organizations across private, public and government landscape are looking at harnessing the power of data in AI to evolve as intelligent enterprises. In the next hour, we will sample some AI led innovations, meet some industry experts and colleagues who are championing efficient use of data in AI and identify key challenges, solutions, and potential areas of harnessing the power of AI for benefit of society and India at large. We need to unite forces to adopt, accelerate, scale, and succeed with AI. RACE 2020 is a great step, a very, very critical step, I would say, in that direction. And I want to applaud the vision of our Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi ji, and thank the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology and Niti Aayog for bringing us together and anchoring this very critical dialogue on this platform on how we can capitalize responsible AI for social empowerment. With that, let us move to the next segment. I am really excited to host this very, very critical discussion around harnessing responsible AI for growth on the sidelines of RACE 2020 with four, uh, with, with actually six leading industry voices. Um, and on this panel, uh, we have Shalni Warrior, Executive Director, Chief Operating Officer and Business Head uh, for Retail at Federal Bank, uh, Sridhanjan Sarma, CIO, Head of Supply Chain and Head of E-Commerce for Best Seller India. Um, Sri Tarun Adarwal, Executive Vice President, Maruti Suzuki Private Limited. And Sri Arvind Shivaramakrishna, CIO, Apollo Hospitals. First of all, colleagues, welcome and thank you for joining us today. It is great to have you all on the panel. And I'll just set the context. I, I just said this in my, in my keynote, but today we are at one of the tipping points in history where technology has become a clear and undeniable force uh, where for business disruption, transformation, and national growth. The convergence of new exponential technologies like AI, automation, IoT, blockchain have led to the emergence of new business models. Processes are being reinvented. Organizations are reimagining the way we all work and thrive. And this is not of any particular industry or sector. The dawn of digital era is quite pervasive, especially technologies like AI are delivering significant business and social benefits today. And its potential to shape the future is even, even, even great, greater. And AI as it has emerged as one of the key levers for democratizing technology, I think it is incumbent on us to sort of harness it as good tech for the greater good. We, you know, we clearly leveraged AI to bridge the digital divide, uh, to find solutions to help, you know, our masses drive medical innovation, deliver citizen services, and help us become more and more intelligent and impactful to grow the in the value chain. So, as the very theme that we have of harnessing responsible AI for growth, in the next sixty minutes, what 
our collective objective is, is to delve on how the industry narrative around AI is evolving in this new world order, which has suddenly accelerated the digital transformational journeys across the board, explore the key opportunities and challenges as we move up the AI ladder at speed and scale, and then talk about the key imperatives that we will need to prepare ourselves for this decade of AI on various fronts like policy, talent, changing industry dynamics, et cetera. So let me, let me start off um, by, by just uh, having an open question to all my, all my panelists here. Uh, how do you see the application of AI now and in the future specific to your respective industries? Shalini, maybe if we can start with you, please. Um, thank you very much, Sandeep, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, a big thank you to Niti Ayog and the Metis for organizing what is a very, very relevant um, kind of topic in today's world on uh, responsible AI for social empowerment. So Sandeep, to your question, uh, from a banking perspective, um, obviously there are multiple opportunities that exist in the banking sector for the use of AI. In fact, the quote uh, that you gave on um, which uh, Mr. Arvind Krishna said resonated very much with me, which said not because they can, but because they must. And I think banking lends that self uh, to it because we are at the cusp of creating a lot of changes in the banking industry and AI can be a driver for a lot of, th for a lot of them. Uh, but the point I think that we need to keep in mind is AI for the sake of AI is not really what banking should do or any of us should do. It's got to lead to some purpose. It's got to lead to some outcomes that are for the uh, greater good of the organization itself, as well as for customers, employees, et cetera. Uh, specifically, I think there are three areas where um, you know AI can play a uh, material role, three of the more prominent. There are millions of areas, but I'll just talk about three of them. The first is on financial inclusion, uh, which is a topic very close to all of us, I know, and to our honorable prime minister. And when I say financial inclusion, I don't mean this in the context of just, you know, kind of opening bank accounts for millions of people. Absolutely, that's required. And we've done a great job of that. But I think how do you get the greater mass of our um, kind of population into the real financial world? How do they access uh, financial advice where they need it at the tip of their fingertips, at their fingertips of a kind and form that is relevant to them? How do they get, um, uh, you know, how are they able to access funding at economical rates of interest? So there, I think AI plays a very critical role because traditionally banks have relied on, you know, kind of a civil score or a kind of, you know, a credit score, which is based on certain amount of attributes, et cetera. But those attributes are not relevant sometimes for the larger mass of our, uh, cust our kind of financial inclusion a population, they have a different set of demographics, they have digital footprint, which is different, they have physical footprint, which is different. So how do you create a score, create a matrix by which they can be assessed in a very practical, pragmatic manner, duly balancing risk, customer experience and all that. So I think financial inclusion is one area, but not in the narrow context of just bank accounts, etc. But the broader context of getting them access to funding in an easy but risk-free manner. That's one area that I think lends itself where AI can kind of, you know, go by leaps and bounds. The second is um, customer experience enhancement. Um, today, um, you know, customers expect that, uh, you know, the bank will treat them as one individual and not as a, just a number in our database, just as a, um, you know, what, what is relevant for a 24 year old just starting his career in let's say IBM um, coming out of engineering college and joining IBM is very different to what is expected by somebody who's you know saying getting ready for retirement for example you know at the different ends of the spectrum so this whole concept of bespokeization as we call it which is the power of one or the attribute of one can only be done through artificial intelligence and the trying to do something like this manually is going to be impossible so how do I create, for example, a proposition in my in my mobile banking, which addresses that engineering graduate and says, hey, you've come into the workforce. Now is the time for you to create a standing instruction for a recurring deposit, a SIP for a mutual fund. And how do I say somebody who's two years away from retirement, you've kind of finished all your loans. Are you clear on what you need as a thing? So that bespokeization is another area where 
you know, using the millions of data points that we have, we can create. The third area is on productivity enhancement. Um, this is, um, you know, margins are under pressure. There is a lot of, um, you know, turmoil in the industry, not just with pandemic, but even pre-pandemic. And I'm sure some of this will continue in the future. So becoming more efficient from a productivity standpoint, being able to kind of deliver revenue at lower and lower costs, um, you know, as margins come under pressure is another area where AI can play a role. A couple of examples um, so that, you know, in the, I think the first is in the area of productivity enhancement, something that we in Federal Bank have done. Uh, we've actually now moved a lot of our recruitment onto an artificial intelligence platform called Fed Recruit. So we take about 600 people from campuses across the country every year. Uh, and we've continued to do that during this period also. And earlier it used to be a very manually driven process of, you know, kind of going into each of these campuses, doing some exam and then, you know, shortlisting, et cetera. A couple of, about a year or so back, we launched Fed Recruit, which is a completely artificial intelligence oriented platform. It does intelligence screening, gamification, um, robotic interviews, behavioral tests, et cetera, and comes out with the result of the candidates. And what we've seen is that it's helped us to reduce cost of recruitment by as high as 75%, while at the same time increasing employee or recruit delight by about 53%. It reduces biases by 47% because we noticed that, you know, we had different people going to different campuses and each one's individual bias would come in, right? But now it's a uniform platform and that I think. So Fed Recruit has been one example of uh, how we've used artificial intelligence for productivity enhancement. Another example where we've used it for bespokeization is something that we're still working on and should be, I think we've um, launched it for employees, but should be going live for customers shortly, um, is our uh, AI-based personal assistant. We call him Mr. Fedi. Um, Fedi is, uh, and most people have an, uh, our personal assistant, but I think the difference we have in ours is we've kind of leveraged artificial intelligence to such an extent that it's not just about feeding in answers into a machine and the machine spouting out the answer, via Mr. Fedi, but really about kind of looking at customer profile, matching it with some of his digital footprints, matching it with some of the transaction history that we have tons of access to, and coming up with personalized answers for each of those questions that the customer would have. So, you know, one example of productivity enhancement and one example of customer experience enhancement are just examples of where AI is being used by us. And if you kind of survey the top 10 banks in the country, you know, private sector, public sector, you will find zillions of examples where each of these is being used. So the industry is pretty well poised to take, um, you know, AI to the next level and uh, leverage the power of data, the power of analytics, the power of, um, you know, the whole artificial intelligence computing that people like IBM have done for us to take it to the next level. So I think banking and uh, federal bank are well poised to take this forward, um, Sandeep. Thank you. That's 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 amazing, and the, what what amazing examples, uh, and and uh, obviously on, on its way to do more. Um, Tarun, uh, maybe if I can turn to you with the same same question in terms of uh, where where are you seeing the application of AI now and future uh, within your specific industry? On a lighter load, the AI cannot unmute the mic somehow. <laughs> okay, so so I, I think th thank you, Sandeep, and thank you, Niti and government for organizing this wonderful event. Okay, I think automotive industry perhaps is is a little different, little more traditional than many of the other industries. I think our basic practices, perhaps some of them, have not changed for I don't know since the Ford Model T. Okay, so I, I looking at what Shalini mentioned, I was going to talk about it, personalization. But automobile is inherently a mass-produced animal. We, we want to make tons and tons of similar car. Everything is black and white is very good for us. But I think consumer is different today. Consumer wants things to, to be identified to him, to be made specific to him, and also to give him a user experience, which is very unique, which meets his or her requirements. I think mean, going forward, the AI or such technologies can bring a good match of mass producing a vehicle, but still giving services which meet the requirements of the individual. Okay. And that's one area where going forward, uh, 
more and more vehicles will be connected. Today, we have Suzuki Connect, where we have around 50,000 odd vehicles. I think going forward, uh, using IBM platform, there will be many more vehicles which will be connected. And this will be able to make us capable of giving these unique experiences to the customers. Also, our product life cycles are long. Uh, typically, a product would take three to four years to develop and all of you use cars, typically we end up using car or somebody's using a car for 10 to 15 years. So considering that kind of a long life cycle, a bad decision initially means you need to live with it for a li lifetime practically. So I think the database decision making is very important for us okay, to take the right decision, understand the consumer correctly, understand the technology correctly and go in that direction. And I think that's one area having good data and good analytics on top of it would really help us going forward. Finally, one more point, which I think is very relevant from a community perspective, which I'll try and touch later on also with some examples, is the sustainability of mobility depends on many things. Today, environment is a big concern, of course, but to our mind at Maruti especially, I think we are really concerned about safety on the roads. And I think that's a key area where we work on. And I think somebody mentioned that uh, government's or prime minister's keenness on having urban infrastructure, which is relevant for India. I think all, all this can really gel together well. And if we can find solutions to ensure that safety is there on the roads and we take right kind of actions. And any intervention at any stage by automakers or by policy, by government, local government really costs money. And spending it in a direction which gives maximum benefit is possible if you use the tools and data well. And also effectivity depends on, I think, collaboration between multiple stakeholders. Okay. Till it is my data and your data, perhaps it is very difficult to move forward. I mean, for to solving community related issues, it has to become our data. And from that point, we can move forward. That's, I think that's what Sandeep to start, I think. That's terrific. To say. that's terrific. And by the way, I love, I love what you just said about our data. I mean, I do believe that, you know, data ownership and insights, ownership of insights is a big issue. I, I get that. But if we can create permissioned data access and others where we can actually bring things together for the power of an ecosystem as a whole, I think that is a, there's a lot we can do. I, I, I completely agree with that. Let me, let me keep moving on in the interest of time. Uh, Ranjan, uh, thoughts, from, thoughts from you around um, AI that you see in your industry. And then I'll, I'll get into a few questions around specifics in, in just a second. Go ahead, Ranjan. Thanks, Sandeep. Uh, and thanks, uh, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology and Niti Aayog. Uh, I think uh, fashion has been uh, one industry where we're Data has always been available, but it has been pretty much defragmented and, and in multiple data sources. So how do you bring that data together? How do you make in, uh, bring in insights out of it? And especially with complexity of fast fashion, where the life cycle itself is very, very low, maybe four to six weeks, eight weeks or max. Uh, it is so much more important to be more precise, more accurate in terms of your predictions in terms of the way how you look at data, take decisions. Uh, I think one of the key aspects where fashion retail has started leveraging AI is the design space itself, because that's the key. The product is the is the strength of this industry. Product is the base. And, and that's one area where you need to be more precise. You need to be more accurate and you need to be more uh, what is desirable because if in a fast fashion space or even even in a fashion space uh, being something or being able to deliver something which will make sense for the consumers as close to the uh, need or the demand uh, is the most important aspect because yes i agree with tarun the life cycle again here is is, is pretty long the whole of the manufacturing cycle normally uh, is, is between 60 days to, to 120 days, or maybe even 180 days at times, uh, depending on the product and depending upon the places where you're procuring it from. Uh, so I think that's one important area where it has started making a lot of inroads in the design space itself. Uh, but there are there are many more areas where, where it potentially can get into. One of the other key areas where it is getting into is the customer service itself. So the whole cognitive bit of customer service itself is, is being delivering a, a huge value to consumers uh, 
not from from just from an uh, organization's perspective from a consumer's perspective to be able to identify the right products for them being able to uh, see whatever they need get right informations help them to take the right decisions uh, i think there are many more areas where it can actually get into so supply chain uh, this is one of the one of the strengths for a fashion retail because the merchandise is being is being manufactured in multiple parts of the world uh, there are so many things which can actually go wrong how how do you get the right information at the right time and be able to bring in that insight to take the right decisions so that you are able to deliver the right product at the right place at the right time because that's the key in fashion retail for for your sales to improve and i think many more areas uh, which is which is which is coming on in terms of merchandising in terms of the whole of the planning itself uh, which is which is key to this industry great uh, great great thoughts and last but not the least let, let me turn to arvind obviously you know healthcare is on top of everyone's minds these days uh, probably some for right reasons some for wrong reasons but uh, arvind if i can turn to you to share some thoughts on uh, where do you see i obviously you all are doing a lot but um, some some comments please like sandeep healthcare is in mind and body and uh, an absolutely uh, you know personal subject and uh, look at it uh, you know we got a billion people on the planet and our capability to service that healthcare is uh, not the demand and supply the numbers just don't tally up uh, any arithmetic any model that you look at is going to go uh, not in a in a in a manner that is acceptable and uh, also look at it from a thing standpoint of uh, at any point in time in healthcare the expectation is nothing other than perfect and the expectation is nothing other than best of the best in the world so that's logical that expectation is logical uh, it's not something that needs explanation but how do we deliver that and how do we ensure that it always happens at quality levels and outcome levels that are always outstanding that means it needs that constant layer of help and support that's really where i see that uh, ai and machine learning and any amount of digital technologies can strongly augment every aspect of it so you look at it in terms of the use cases that would be there clearly clinical efficacies looking at the tons and tons of data that we have how do we build algorithms that constantly enforce automated pathways and protocols at point of care bringing in that whole body of knowledge that ensures that quality of service and the efficiency of service so the moment you look at efficiency of service another huge problem that faces the healthcare industry is the operational ability the creation of that capacity look at it when the pandemic started the the ability by which the healthcare industry started making alternate arrangements for increasing bed capacities oxygen beds and all of that that's capacity building understand that we are in a pandemic uh, crisis and the ways of thinking but how do you make the thinking the norm because that need is always there and all physical capacity is something that may not always be in our convenience so that's really looking at in, in terms of the operational pathways protocols uh, forcing evidence based medicines building operational credibility that's really how we look at it and then the biggest aspect of healthcare how do we keep people well and how do we continue to keep people well because this is not about get people sick uh, work on them get them fine and move them back uh, and you know what in healthcare we are in an industry where we really can't tell our patients and our customers thank you please come back again we're not supposed to say that it's absolutely unethical for us to even think in those terms so how do we keep people well and continue to keep people well so here you're looking at and for a country like india where non communicable diseases are you know it's part of our genetics it's part of our uh, the way in which you know our bodies and our uh, genomes have been sequenced so how do we look at it in terms of keeping preventive medicine aided by strong machine learning cognitive learning algorithms 
and those cognitive learning algorithms that come from uh, uh, from various aspects that come from data and beautifully as you said our data it has to come from our data because it has to treat this subcontinent of population it really can't come from the west because that's indeed a learning but the applicability of that learning comes from intelligence built out of our data and that constant learning of our data so better and better and better that we get then we are looking at a preventive health model that can serve the entire population now you're talking scale here so really i see machine learning ai cognitive algorithms forming in all these things and prescriptive and predictive algorithms helping us keep that watch on quality service operational efficiency and ensuring that we are best and best and nothing but the best because that's everybody's expectation out of healthcare so i see you know uh, uh, like you said definitely not artificial intelligence but augmented intelligence that will keep our health system not only our doctors and our clinical professionals who are working tirelessly but the entire healthcare community everybody who's directly and indirectly part of it will greatly benefit by that augmented intelligence because that's really going to help build that capacity that we really don't have to do. so that's how i see benefit of all of this happening now that's terrific and very very well said i mean uh, i just took some notes as uh, the eminent panelists were talking and i i i mean a lot of there are a lot of words that just sort of uh, resonated i think inclusion uh, was one the whole notion of customer or consumer experience and how that can be enhanced um, the whole notion of um, i love this notion of constant learning of our data you know the whole notion of our data and then constant learning applied to that prescriptive predictive al algorithms which i think well which is where i think the world is in fact going and the whole notion of ensuring that there's productivity but there's also innovation in terms of new solutions that we are bringing to the table um and then you know augmenting intelligence of the knowledge worker i think that that you know as you closed with that that was excellent so i'm I, what i'm going to do is now move to some specifics because i think each of you have um, have actually accomplished a lot in this space uh, independently and i think if i can um, maybe what i'll do is i'll start ranjan with you right uh, you've made a ton of progress in in the whole uh, area of retail and in ai can you just talk to what were the ingredients for your success and are there any replicable or scalable solutions or best practices that you learned that could benefit either people in the retail space or in your ecosystem as a whole thanks andip so i'll go back to my previous uh, discussion that i that i was talking about so uh, product design that's that's a key area uh, being able to find the right product uh, which which just not because let's let's keep in mind that uh, fashion is the biggest polluting industry in the world uh, the amount of pollution that we create by washing clothes by dyeing and many other things uh, that's that's enormous and and today is the time when we start and need to start going back and giving back to nature earth uh, so one of the key things that we started with was how could we improve in terms of our designing capability how could we become more precise how could we become more relevant uh, to solve these problems what what we did was we started looking at our internal data but as as we've all been talking about internal data is not enough it there needs to be our data and that's that's the key because predicting information uh, predicting something from your internal data might just give you whatever you've done in the past but how do you bring in that external data to be able to support and be able to predict a new trend so that's an area where we uh, we we looked into and we said how could we leverage ai in that space because product being the king for retail fashion retail and especially with india uh, becoming the youngest uh, population where fast fashion is is a big big ask uh, how could we deliver precise fashion um, at a right price uh, maybe not at a cheaper price but at a right price that's that's the key and the right shades the colors the fits which are important for the consumer because let's accept the fact that india is a diverse country what is relevant in punjab might not be relevant in kerala 
uh, what what is relevant in northeast might not be relevant in 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 mumbai so you've got to understand those local nuances uh, be more precise in terms of what you're designing how you're designing and when are you going to launch because fashion changes every few months uh, you also need to keep that in mind trends keep changing every day there are new trends which keep evolving i remember a classic case uh, when there were color pants which came in uh, we we developed color pants and uh, delivered to the market and it was a huge flop for us uh, it just did not work uh, uh, i think way back in 2014 13 14 uh, colored chinos uh, we did not develop that for the next season and the next season everyone else developed and that product was a great hit everyone else was buying that product so how do you how do you you need to be ahead of the curve but also you need to time it right that's important because the market has to be ready for that product that you deliver uh, so that's a space that we started looking into about a couple of years back uh, fortunately it was me and my ceo who were going to ibm research lab at bangalore and one of our brands was not doing great uh, the previous season because it was a fantastic brand the only brand uh, for women's wear young women's wear uh, and we, we we had that question as to what has changed because uh, it's the same product it's the same team it's the same uh, same thing same processes that we've been doing what has changed that has uh, pulled back this particular brand and we threw this question to the research lab folks and they said let's think through and let's come back to you with answers that's where we started this ideation phase and we said how could we pull out the existing data how could we make the designers more productive uh, by reducing the number of designs that they create but becoming more precise as well and how do we time it right so that we deliver to the to the people at the right time the stores to the right time to the different channels that we have at the right time and it has been a huge success because the brands uh, they are the flag bearers for this product uh, and one of the good things that we also did was we involved the brand teams the designers uh, who are slightly finicky uh, i'm sorry for saying that but they are slightly finicky they love their the apple max the best and that's their world uh, they love to go to milan and and spot fashion uh, getting them to work on data getting insights from data which could be your data as well as external data and be able to leverage it Uh, was the next big task so we what we did was we brought in nlp to make that data much more easier for these guys to to be able to harness that data and get insights from it so that they, they are able to get informations at the fingertips uh, then what we brought in is we brought in a lot of product image curation where rather than searching at a data level in terms of numbers uh, they were searching more at product because that's what they are able to relate to Uh, that's what they understand the best uh, and i think that's the key to the success of this project or or whatever we've done in this this space because the important aspect is to bring in the key stakeholders very early into it at the same time what we also did was we did not create too much of a hype around ai because that's a big risk that one is running the moment you start creating hype around ai there's a lot of expectation that starts getting built around it and then people start expecting miracles to happen uh, that's not going to be the case because it ai will not deliver miracles on day one uh, it's it's important to identify the right use case which can give you deliver substantial benefits uh, the other important uh, aspect uh, to to uh, look at was uh, how do you how do you make it more inclusive so it was not just the designers who actually get in, impacted by the right products or the designs that they create it's the merchandisers it's the sales guys is the store store operations guys how do you bring them early into the stage so that it becomes much more collaborative rather than the decision solely being taken by the designers so how do you make it much more collaborative on a real time uh, get informations at the fingertips and and be able to harness that data to support their decision making rather not take decisions for them so that's a key thing it's it's not about ai being able to take decisions for them uh ai supporting them to take those decisions was important so i think these are some of the key learning that we've had uh which which is a very good uh, factor which which if can be replicated uh, to other projects i think they can deliver huge benefits uh to to any uh, the success of any projects no thank you and i think this notion of engaging stakeholders without making a lot of hype about ai i think is is a is a great point because at the end of the day it is about you know i think as we discussed in the in the earlier session it's all about augmented intelligence and i think if people can appreciate that this is actually helping them 
make better decisions. I don't know, a few days ago, I was talking to someone many, many years ago, I did some work in retail. And um, when we went to the merchandisers or the stockists, they kept referring to, and we were building a system. I mean, this was pre, you know, the AI, the way we know it, know it. but they kept saying, you know, you need to understand the touch and feel of to determine where which product should go to which stores. And this, yep. this was sort of a mental model they had, but to codify that and put it in, in an algorithm that actually made sense was, was a fascinating exercise. And this was sort of, uh, I think when we were still coding in COBOL and others, but it was, <laughs> but it was, it was interesting to sort of understand that mental model. There is always these heuristics, which I think now are becoming more and more relevant. That that's that's an excellent excellent uh, excellent piece. So actually, maybe maybe I go, come back to come back to Shalini and Shalini. You talked about customer experience, and I think probably in in this industry, and I've lived in this industry for a while now. Uh, the whole notion of customer experience is, I think, taking a new meaning because you're dealing with increasing increasingly digital digitally savvy and digitally educated uh, consumers who are actually expecting you know, you to operate not just as a bank, but as a, as a, as a digital enterprise, right? So two questions I'll ask you. One is, as you've gone through that journey, right? Any um, words of guidance for others who are in that journey, probably not as, as engaged, but you know, who are trying to get there, number one. Number two, I know that you, um, in, in your enterprise, you obviously, are trying to get to a lot more financial inclusion around getting to rural and other uh, parts of, of, of country where which are now also starting to become digitized in a different way. Uh, any guidance on how we can channelize AI, uh, you know, for generate growth, uh, to generate growth even in far flung rural areas through a differentiated customer experience? So maybe it's a little bit of a complex question, but I figured I know you've done a lot of thinking on it. So I'll, I'll post that to you. So, uh, um, thanks, Sandeep. Uh, so, I'll probably take um, the first one, which is from kind of learning or, you know, a challenge. And I think this leads very well from what Ranjan said. So, um, one of the challenges we saw really was uh, how do you kind of have the, uh, the organizational patience to wait for results? You know, that was something that I think Ranjan alluded to that to say, you know, success doesn't happen in AI overnight you've got to be patient enough to recognize that it, it is a journey and this journey has to be, you have to go through the journey. Yes, you can expedite some parts of it, you can fast track some parts of it, but at the end of the day, you've got to make sure that you have the, uh, the staying power to go through it. So, you know, a practical example of that was on FedRecruit. It was not that overnight we were able to do that and, you know, get the right results. We had to do a lot of experimentation. And there were times when, you know, some of our uh, colleagues working on it, some of our partners working with us kind of tended to lose a little bit of their motivation, et cetera. So you've got to keep at it going and over and over again. And that's where it's important to celebrate minor successes, to kind of, you know, uh, pat somebody on the back and say, you know, it's important. We're doing the right thing. There will be some areas which don't work, but keep at it, you know, and uh, keep it. And that's not something that you do just at an individual level, but the organization has to have that staying ability. The organization has to have that belief that this will work and therefore you need to work. And this can only happen if you kind of align all the levels of the organization, get everybody into it in a kind of a manner which is, um, you know, collaborative in nature. Um, the other aspect of it was, um, I think there were examples we had in our own bank where we tended to keep this into a small group of people and only involved, for example, my specialist digital banking team. And we realized that this wasn't working, you know, so in the example of the chatbot, we've actually widened the scope and we have literally everybody across the organization doing some way or the other contributing from picking the name of the bot to the picture of the bot to something as simple as that to more evolved stuff of entering, you know, details into, et cetera, into the, you know, into the machine learning algorithm, et cetera. So I think this making it all pervasive, making it collaborative, making it more inclusive has been one of the key learnings and having the staying power because success will not come overnight on this. 
um you, there will be some failed experiments there will be some uh, areas where you know things may not go to plan you've got to have that staying power as an organization and as individuals so that's been i think learning and going in with your mind open to that possibility making sure when you start off something you're kind of aware that this is something that will take time is very important so i think that probably is one of the biggest learnings we've had and over the last couple of years we've become better and better still some more to do but we've become better and better at being more inclusive within the organization and leading from that also becoming more inclusive within the industry as a whole so we kind of you know banks uh, tend to work quite closely with each other though they we are competitive we have our competitive streaks and they but we become you know like npci is doing a very great job of getting us together to become more interoperable in nature rbi with its innovation hub that it's planning to will you know open the doors for some of that collaboration so yes there is a level of external collaboration but i'm more emphasizing what is required internally to take the organization to the next level on the ai journey so that i think sandeep is the second part of what you had or the first question that you had on the um, element of financial inclusion and the customer experience part of it i think that one is still work in progress honestly for the industry as a whole as well as for um, you know organizations like us but i think there are three areas that we need to still do as an organization and as you know between uh, ministry of finance R reserve bank of india all of us uh, the first is i think this whole uh, concept of data and i'm not i mean i think we've spoken about data data privacy i'm sure will come up extensively in any conversation on ai etc so um, the uh, the uh, thing with tarun and you mentioned the our data all of that is very very important but i think i what i want to what i really want to emphasize is how do we get to a stage where from a data perspective the powers that be in some form or fashion lay a standard um, operating model for all banks to operate in today uh, a lot of the dis discussions around data tend to be bank specific bank a has a different risk appetite on data to bank b which has a different risk appetite and therefore probably bank a's risk appetite is higher and is therefore able to do a lot more with data bank b may not so getting into some sort of you know a level playing field on saying this is possible with uh, with permissioned data this is possible with a uh, tracked data this is possible some sort of um, you know i'm pushing the envelope a little bit by saying we need some amount of uh, level playing field otherwise you will you will otherwise a thousand flowers will not bloom a couple of flowers may bloom ba based on what the bank is that's the first thing and linked or you know kind of corollary to that is the whole notion of innovation so banks have not banks in the banking industry the banking regulators are not kind of naturally innovative right i mean it, we we're dealing with customers money we are dealing with um, you know shareholders money we tend to be obviously protective of it and need to be but ai can only bloom if you allow some level of innovation and therefore kind of you know laying the framework and this is where i think rbi will do a great job with its innovation hub so the second aspect of it is allow some proofs of concept let it go ahead i mean you you will not sell the bank off you will only you know some amount of experiments will be allowed so i think this whole notion of innovation and proof of concept and you know having that ethos and philosophy that it's all right to do some of these and fail is something that needs to be done and the third area is this risk of too much legislation you know we've got to be careful that there is not too much legislation coming in into this area a little moving more towards the principle based legislation rather than rule based legislation absolutely you need rule based legislation on things like capital adequacy you have to comply with basel you have to do all that as uh, areas where rule based legislation absolutely has to be there but there are some areas like ai where i think it will be more likely to be principle based legislation and that is what we should move towards so if we get these three things the uh, uh, you know getting a data privacy framework in place which is common across banks getting rule based get moving away from rule based to principle based legislation and encouraging more innovation we'll see a lot more in the financial inclusion area right now i think we're still just touching the periphery of it the, um you know there's still a lot more for the banking industry to do and i think between all of us we will have to take it to the next level sandeep no this is uh, uh, no it's a these are great great points data privacy i think the whole notion of permission data sharing but i love the point you made about principle based legislation i still remember a few years ago 
uh, while we were sort of talking about blockchain, I, I had the privilege of presenting to all of the, uh, the whole body of uh, uh, insurance commissioners for all the states in the US. And uh, I was at their annual meet and I presented. And I think one of the first questions that came up is, okay, what, what are your thoughts on how should, we, how should we regulate blockchain? And I said, this is one thing which you don't want to regulate. Actually, this will give you enough trusted data sharing and others. So you probably don't want to regulate this one, but let let people you know innovate with this. So it's it's a, it's a, it's a artificial great. intelligence block. Just like blockchain, I think artificial intelligence is an area where if you run the risk of too much legislation, uh, you know it'll become risky for uh, yeah. experimentation. Yeah. No, no, this is this is great. So uh, if I can turn to um, Arvind, uh, maybe, uh, and and there is a question that has come up also on the on the on the portal. So I'll 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 fold that in. So clearly, you know, you're witnessing we're witnessing a lot of AI from a research perspective in healthcare. You you talked about you know from a provider st standpoint as well. But beyond that, other areas of applications where you think it could be a game changer. And actually, a very specific question that has come up, uh, Arvind, is is this the right time to use AI-based application to diagnose the disease in human and animal body? This is a this is a note that has come up in the in the portal. So, uh, Arvind, I know this is uh, this has just come up, so I figured I'll put it out to you and uh, over to you. In fact, uh, you know, I'll go with the question in terms of you know, is this the the right time to use AI? Uh, there's nothing like a right time and wrong time as long as we are using that technology as a strong enabler. And what is it that we are using it for? Speed to diagnosis. So you're looking at the uh, trend, you're looking at a pattern. And that's why I also mentioned the cognitive algorithm intelligence that goes with it. You're looking at it in terms of figuring out, okay, what's going on? What could this be? And how can we fast track the related diagnostics so that you arrive at a speed with a firm diagnosis and thereby start the entire treatment plan. So that means that the sooner you get the treatment plan in, your length of stay, your treatment process is going to be faster. Your road to wellness is going to be on a faster course. So really, we have got to look at it as speed to diagnosis and speed and using all of this also so that you don't miss something. What do I mean by miss something? And uh, at Apollo, we implemented uh, machine learning algorithms on MRIs with brain bleeds. And this is a very, very difficult one to get because you know uh, you can't miss it. And if you delay multiple people looking at it, multiple tests, uh, the uh, the outcome that is happening to the person suffering that could be not uh, desirable at all. It could be very bad. And uh, how can you get this so that people don't mistake it for the grayscale level that they typically look at in a, uh, in a radiology image? So use that sort of a machine learning algorithm so that it can aid and it can be a little more uh, supportive. So here, uh, like what Shalini mentioned, I wouldn't call it experimentation, but you know, it's better to go on the excess side so that you are more safe. And thereby, uh, here the the risk of a false positive in this is, I would say, much better than the miss. So that way, you you're being a strong enabler, and you're being a strong enabler at that very very. And you uh, remember, I'm talking of all of this in seconds and minutes. This is not something that you have lots of time to look at. And for brain bleeds, they call this the golden hour and all of that where you really need to act beyond which the condition is not reversible. That means the patient has permanent uh, you know, uh, disabilities that would be caused. So you're looking at examples where in the healthcare, you're building this to efficiency. Then, okay, we've spoken a lot about clinical and you know, the moment people think healthcare, they start thinking clinical, so everything has to be about the brain and the heart and all of that, you know. <laughs> so there must be something more in healthcare than <laughs> the organs only. And that's the entire healthcare ecosystem. So what we learn from the automotive sector, what we learn from the retail sector, 
to support the healthcare operational efficiency so that you are able to right size it you are able to predict it uh, you are able to prepare for it a uh, beautiful example most relevant in today's time paracetamol come on seven months ago it was generally available okay <laughs> now it's priced position <laughs> you know i don't i wish we don't see the stage where we trade gold for uh, paracetamol <laughs> so you're looking at predicting that you're looking at creating those models and as we are getting into the vaccine stage and all of that these models are going to be more and more relevant i'm not talking of the clinical aspect of it i'm talking of the back office supply chain efficiency of how do you do it because unless that is done your healthcare is not going to be as pristine and all of them when they sing in harmony is when healthcare is delivered so you're looking at the finance uh, supply chain and then comes the most important aspect and what uh, you uh, uh, our colleagues mentioned right pricing it so again models that will ensure right pricing so that you are not wasting a lot of money providing a service that is not going to be beneficial and not able to provide it not able to predict it in terms of availability so all of those and here again obviously it comes to that high degree of consumer and customer alignment you got in this time you yes it is empathy that governs healthcare but beyond empathy you got to be realistic in terms of what is there so do that customer uh, uh, interaction in an intelligent and guided manner we are not predicting the future i uh, you know this is not to say that with healthcare and ai we are playing god no and that's a constant question that gets asked of me when uh, you know machine learning and ai comes in are we making the healthcare system irrelevant that's not the conversation at all it is about augmenting it it is about playing a strong enabler role so that healthcare can be delivered in aspects of clinical in aspects of primary healthcare and then in the entire support system and in, in the clinical aspects uh, we've got uh, an algorithm for detecting cardiovascular risk factors get them early so that you can put them on diet and exercising not even medicines as supposed to dealing with the sad state of them having a sting a heart related uh, event for which the treatment is going to be much more difficult and not very you know expected so instead get them early it's just about diet and exercise so use the algorithms that means building the social uh, uh, behavioral aspects bringing their hereditary behavioral aspects bringing their workplace health and uh, some if you work in in uh, in it so stress is something that comes as part of our offer letter you know uh, <laughs> uh, it's part of our salary component so yeah. you know that so why don't we you know use that intelligence figure out what they are and thereby bring those patterns and start attacking the problem earlier so that we are, so it's about you know uh, prevention is better than cure is probably goes well with uh, with ai too and that's really how you look at all these models coming together and the various use cases that go in it definitely uh, the if uh, the efficiency of the algorithm the level of its correctness needs to go through enough number of retrospective and prospective studies good sample rates before it is put on a large population so you just can't randomly experiment because this is a human body we are talking of a human life we are talking of everything is precious so i think that level of care and ethical uh, parlance has to be applied that level of responsibility has to be applied and still like i said it's an uh, enabler not the decider so that way when you put it in perspective i think you have a a well laid out uh, you know charter no thank you thank you arvind and I, i i can really relate to your point around you know sort of the whole notion of prevention i actually spent a lot of years in the insurance industry and i'm actually a firm believer that because of data and ai i think the whole paradigm of that industry is shifting from managing the risk of loss to managing the risk of prevention because data and ai actually allows you to do that right 
and and your your point around you know sort of getting it to be more predictive models supply chain understanding the whole supply chain excellent and and now i'm going to turn to tarun with a very specific question and actually tarun there is another question and actually the timing is perfect with so the the portal is on on fire with a lot of questions coming through right and uh, this question came through i didn't time it personally but the uh, question just came through on 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 vehicle so i was going to ask you more about tarun you know as you have obviously used iot ai and others in your industry how do you see that you know sort of uh, going to the entire ecosystem and enabling ai in the ecosystem but then there is a specific question that has come up if you would care to answer is can ai help in the transition to electric vehicles and is there any potential for autonomous vehicles in india so i'll leave you with that question as a specific one for your industry i'll i'll, I'll come to the i mean the second one first okay okay of course there is potential i i would not say that there is no potential well, only thing is that we need to remember that uh, Uh, an automobile moving at 100 kilometers an hour weighing 1000 to 2000 kgs is like a missile so i mean you have to be careful who is controlling it based on what algorithm you are controlling that missile okay so so i i think uh, i mean that that's all so it, it, if you have the know how and reliability of the data on which you are training your algorithms perhaps uh, it, it is definitely possible to have autonomous vehicles but i think uh, ai will be used earlier in other consumer applications and automotive would perhaps take a little bit more time especially when you talk of controlling the vehicles but definitely there are other areas where you help driver drive better and do things better do things easily do things more conveniently i'm sure those applications will happen first okay so so c- c- coming to the first yeah. <laughs> part of the iot part <laughs> i think if you look at the industry i mean not only us anybody i think uh, a typical touch point with the customer is when he purchases the vehicle and maybe comes to us uh, for service every 6 months so if a typical ownership cycle is 6 to 8 years uh, we are getting in touch with the customer maybe a couple of uh, or 10 odd minutes every time uh, unlike a banking or other industry perhaps okay for a period of maybe i don't know in a period of 10 year 20 or touch points if, if that is if he comes to the oem for service during the end of the life cycle but that is changing dramatically now with connected vehicles uh, the vehicle is sending data back to the company or our databases are getting richer every minute and we know a lot more about vehicles based on that data than we used to know earlier so what can we do how, how can we we all of us are speaking about consumer experience i think that's one common thread for any industry so how can we leverage this data to deliver better experiences and i think that's where we are working along with ibm to ensure that we are able to do that so some examples i'll share so i mean somebody spoke of insurance you So to today in India, whether you are using your vehicle two thousand kilometers in a year, there are users who use as less as that, and some people who may be driving hundred thousand kilometers in a year, you are paying same for your insurance. Okay, but it does not vary much depending on how you drive, where you drive, what you do. So can we use our knowledge of the user, the way he uses the vehicle, to bring down or optimize his total cost of ownership? and that's connected to electric vehicles as well so the challenge of the electric vehicle is uh, twofold of course the initial asset cost is very high and also the infrastructure ability to predict where he will reach how he will reach and whether he will reach and so people living in delhi and gurgaon are very familiar i mean of course covid has changed things a little that uh, from going home in the evening a gurgaon a 20 km journey to delhi could 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 take any, anywhere between 1 to 4 hours depending on whether it is rained that day or not or something else has happened and with an electric vehicle it can be a real nightmare but technology can come to his rescue at least in in that kind of an event technology or ai can ensure that uh, he somehow manages to reach home is not stranded on the road so so in that context i think in electrification ai has a huge role to play 
Also, as far as the charging infra is concerned, I think it is an optimization exercise. So how, how do you optimally put resources depending, depending on the need, where people live, where people drive, where people use? So there also, I think AI models will come in very handy. Great. Great. And, and uh, just a couple of points from IoT perspective. I think all of us have used cars, and I'm sure all of us would have gone through a simple experience of one fine day in the winter, the vehicle is not starting, battery is dead. I'm quite sure all of us have gone through this at some point in time or the other. So I think this is something simple. I, I think it's not very complicated to build a model which will tell you maybe reasonably a month or a couple of months in advance that better boss change your battery, otherwise you might get stuck. So I, I think doing these simple things can really improve consumer experience. No, so I, I think definitely IoT can be used. I think we are running less on time, so I would give others opportunities. I think there are some new people who have joined. Yeah, no, no, that's great. I, I mean, I think this whole notion of preventative maintenance that you mentioned, using IoT, you know, as you move and more more towards electrification and others, I think excellent points. So I'm actually now going to do a, a quick rapid fire round for all of all of you as we as we wrap up and move to some of the other panelists who have joined. But um, I, I'm just going to ask each of you one question. As you've gone through this, uh, one you know if you can if you can talk to one or few of the of the challenges that you've seen and some thoughts about addressing it. And specifically, a question has come in for Shalini and Ranjit. So I'll I'll say this, and this is actually this this could be one of the challenges that you can you can talk to. How important is it to have a data lake for realizing the full potential of artificial intelligence? And you know what? How do you how do you get around um, to addressing that either need or if you would call it a challenge at all? So maybe if I can maybe start again with with Shalini, if I can ask you to go with you know, sort of challenge and words of advice. And if we can keep it to like two or three minutes each, yeah. that would be great. Um, Thanks, Sandeep. So I think uh, I probably alluded to some of this earlier uh, in my earlier session, which is to say the real challenge was about the collab, the need to kind of get the entire organization aligned on this journey of artificial intelligence. Uh, from you know top to everybody else in the organization, how do you get them aligned on the journey and the staying power that you know, things don't happen overnight. So think about it and kind of stay in over there. Success will come. Uh, but um, I think I'll just take the question then. It might be more interesting. And I think that would be, um, you know, uh, so it goes without saying, and I think we've all said it, that data is the underpinning kind of philosophy behind the whole of artificial intelligence. And that is true for us in the banking industry as a whole, as well as in federal bank. Whether you need a data lake, don't need a data lake, I think those are technical issues. You absolutely need a, a warehouse, a lake, something which stores all the data, both structured, unstructured data. You need to be able to tag it correctly. All of that is there. And there are enough technology tools out there in the industry that can um, you know, kickstart you on, on all of us on that journey. But I think the bigger issue is the cleanliness of the data. Um, and um, you know, I can see Anup, um, Anup uh, from uh, State Bank of India. I'm sure he can relate to it as much as we can. So we are an organization which is 75 years old. So we've been boarding customers from, and it's kind of gone generations, right? I mean, got generations of customers who are with us. The quality of the data I have is not necessarily the most pristine data. It's not necessarily the most uh, sophisticated data. The recent onboarding is obviously much better, but I still have legacy customers. I have customers who've been with me for 30 years, 40 years, etc. So getting the data into a form and fashion which lends itself to, um, you know, artificial intelligence, getting it into a, um, you know, the, the demographic data is not necessarily the cleanest of data for most banks. Um, you know, we end up with maybe multiple customer IDs for the same persons. Basics like that have to be overcome. So data lake is important to the question that was asked by the audience, uh, but that's more a technology. You can buy it literally in the market, et cetera, and you can get the best of uh, your IBM to come and put it up for us, Sandeep, no doubt about it. But what goes in over there, if that ends up being garbage, it's garbage in, garbage out, the traditional philosophy. So the whole cleanliness of data is something that banks like us are grappling with and contending with and um, you know having to work on. So that's clearly something 
that does need a lot of work. Otherwise, you end up making the wrong decisions. You end up uh, with biases which you don't want to have uh, because you just didn't have clean data to start with. So uh, that's how I would kind of address that question that came on data, Sandeep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe moving on to Ranjan. Uh, Ranjan, thoughts from you. One challenge, how you would, uh, uh, you know, thoughts on how one might address it. And then obviously uh, the, the data lake question was addressed to you and Shalini specifically. So go ahead. Yeah, Sandeep, so I think uh, what's important is um, the biggest challenge that we all been grappling with is the skill availability to be able to uh, create these models, run these models, maintain and manage them. Uh, so it's not about the business not being ready. I think business is ready. Uh, to some extent, I it, it definitely needs a little more of conditioning. Uh, but two challenges majorly which keeps coming, and we've been talking a lot about it. One is definitely the data. Uh, but the thought process itself, the skills available within the organization and outside the organization are important aspects to be able to deliver the right benefits or the right uh, right nuances of why do you need an AI. AI is not needed for the sake of AI. Uh, AI is supposed to solve a problem uh, for the organization. And hence the alignment within the organization, uh, data sitting in multiple pockets and to uh, bringing them all together, uh, making sense out of that, uh, yes, for sure is important. Data Lake, I agree with Shalini, whether Data Lake or no Data Lake, it's, it's more of more of a decision in terms of your architecture, in terms of what kind of data you would want to analyze and what what, what kind of data you, you would want to use for what purposes. Uh, but yes, for larger data sets, Data Lake definitely helps uh, where, where you have structured and unstructured data sitting in multiple places. Uh, data Lake definitely helps uh, to, to deliver that benefit but I still leave it uh, to the use case wherever you need uh, to deliver whatever benefits or whatever you have thought of. So skills definitely is a challenge. Uh, availability of internal resources is a huge challenge because uh, every organization goes with a bare minimum people, a bare minimum uh, resources within the organization to run the function. So internal business people's availability is very, very important and the organization's maturity to be able to handle a failure because not every time you're going to, uh, to, to be successful. Uh, there are a lot of learnings that, that will keep coming. The ability to handle a failure is very, very important. Great, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ranjit. Tarun, maybe come to you. Uh, challenges, words of advice real quick for, for, for our audience. I'll just give an example, I think, which will which will perhaps explain the challenge. So Ma Ma Maruti did a campaign of Pehni Kya around seed built awareness a couple of years back. And I, I think after that, I was trying to analyze that how many lives could be saved if people were wearing seed belts. Okay, and we looked at the MORTH data, but the, typically in India, we have 1.5 lakh accidents every year. And we were trying to find ways and means to analyze, but we could not find enough data there to make any analysis out of it, even though there are numbers but the detail is totally missing. So we looked at one more data which is available is there's a RASI consortium which does accident analysis very detailed and they have done analysis around 2000 vehicles. So we looked at each of those parameters and made a algorithm to actually predict how many lives would have been saved. And you would be surprised that out of the 1.5 lakh lives which are lost, 30,000 are in passenger cars. And we, this data was mostly for passenger cars. We looked at that and we were able to reasonable around 90 odd percent accuracy predict that out of those 30,000 people, 7.5 thousand lives would have been saved if they were wearing seatbelt. So, so, so date, data or analysis tells us very clearly that where to spend your money. So I think rather than doing anything, if you're able to enforce seat belt, 25% deaths in passenger cars, accidents could be avoided. So the point I'm trying to make is that for us to make decisions, somebody spoke about legislations. I think legislations for India should be based on data of India, it should not be based on data of Europe or somewhere else. So I was looking that, for example, UK, you have 15 years of very, very detailed data about accidents available for anybody to see on Kegel or something for people to play around. 
So if we want to have the right infrastructure, safety of people on road, I think having right kind of accident data as an example. And that's where we said we, we need to collaborate. I mean, there are local government, state government, central government, different people are having data in different formats, different methods. So, so that's an example that if you have some kind of standardization and a common purpose and intent, I think we can do much better using data and using AI better for the community for real social good as well. Great. Thanks. Great. No, great, great, great comments. Arvind, I'll come to you. We've got, you know, we are at the, at the top of the hour. Um, quick words of challenge and any advice. And then we'll we'll wrap up and move to the couple of the other uh, guests that I have. I think one is ensuring that the transactional system is well uh, no, defined to uh, to give the data that we require. And while we are doing this design, not get over enthusiastic and make it uh, a complete data you know a nightmare that uh, the user experience is completely lost. So I think that's one place that where design is a challenge that gets the outcome. And the second aspect, like what Ranjan mentioned, getting the right people the knowledge so that they can curate that algorithm and work out the several aspects. And sometimes here, even getting the talent to uh, define the problem statement is a challenge. You can't work with a 50,000 feet uh, problem statement. It's, uh, it's not going to help uh, the outcome. So uh, that is an aspect and then putting in that into a sustainable, scalable model. So we've got plenty of pilots, very, very successful pilots. And then, you know, we're just happy with the pilot, mission accomplished, uh, we move on to the next pilot. So uh, making that a sustainable model and that means that working with the organization in terms of building those revised standard operating practices that imbibe AI and ML into the day-to-day -day function. So how do we bring this into the DNA of the organization and our culture? And how do we build the talent to continuously be at it? It's not a one-time exercise where we find people because finding people in a, in a uh, planet of a billion people is still difficult. So, so how do we find the people continuously building the talent pool so that the entire ecosystem is well serviced? I think this, these are the challenges that we go through uh, trying to get these into day-to-day -day execution. Great. I, I think, I, I mean, look, uh, very rich conversation. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, all of the panelists. Uh, I think we had some amazing data points relative to the need for innovation. I think the fact that you need the right kinds of skills to embed the right thought process so we are getting to the right out outcomes. I think the notion of organizational patience and standard operating models, frameworks to allow um, POC, I love the notion of principle-based legislation. Um, I think that's something that we should uh, amplify a lot more and, and work collectively, I think, with the government to, and regulators to sort of move that forward. And, and the whole notion of the importance of design. So uh, thank you. Uh, I, I welcome all the panelists to stay on. I want to, I, I want to sort of switch to the next part of, of, of the session. And look, we've talked a lot about digital banking, AI acceleration during this pandemic, and how we are leveraging technologies like AI to build, enable, and transform the banking ecosystem. Um, I want to move on to, uh, State Bank of India. State Bank of India has been championing this thread by being India's largest public sector bank, and they've been doing some amazing work. I'm delighted, absolutely delighted, to welcome uh, Shri Anup Mahapatra, Deputy Managing Director, State Bank of India, who has front-ended the bank's digital transformation journey. During his over three-decade-long career, Mr. Mahapatra has worked in almost all areas of banking in multiple geographies. At State Bank of India, he has pioneered advanced analytics by introducing multiple machine learning uh, models covering all critical domains like business growth, uh, warning of stress in loan accounts, fraud, income leakage, thereby adding significant value to the organization. Sir, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm also very excited to welcome- Thank you very much, Sandeep. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Mahapatra. I'm also thrilled to welcome 
Uh, my dear colleague, Lula Mohanty, General Manager of our Global Business Services Asia Pacific. In her 20 plus years uh, at IBM, Lula has undertaken a number of domestic and international responsibilities, led engagements with marquee clients, including State Bank of India, and brings a wealth of global expertise in areas of strategy and business consulting. Lula, it's great to have you with us here today. Uh, I'm going to just jump right in and uh, uh, direct this first question uh, to Mr. Mahapatra. State Bank of India's Ghar Se Banking, even during COVID-19, has really brought to life Atma Nirbharta uh, in a true sense. And in doing so, you adopted both the digital and traditional routes. How would you describe the bank's crucial role in this regard, sir? Yeah, thanks, Sandeep, uh, for this beautiful question. Let me just give a few statistics because a bank of this size, uh, hardly there are one or two banks maybe in the globe, possibly the Bank of China. So just to give some statistics that having 45 crores of customers with uh, almost 18 crores of transaction going on on a daily basis, with approximately 7,500 transactions per second. And 91.5% uh, uh, of the total transactions are going outside the branch channel, leaving only 8.5% of the total transactions going through the branch channel. So how this is possible? Being a legacy bank of this size, this was possible because of the decade-old technological transformations which the bank has adopted in the past decade. And last three, four years also phenomenally transformational journey in the IT ecosystem. So the, if I go into one of the journeys, you know, being now a global brand, it's a flagship project, a mobile app, which is a digital bank, a financial superstore, as well as online marketplace. So one in all, it's a platform, nowhere in the globe it is available. This is a very powerful platform. And today, if you look into that, there are almost 2.8 crores of our customers who have already been registered and almost 70 lakhs of transactions are going through this platform on a daily basis. And this is scaling up like anything. So this is going to be the next gen digital platform from the, not only the millennials, but also what we also observe is that even the rural population also started adopting this ecosystem. So that is a phenomenal transformation looking into the digital economy that India is moving towards. So with this background, if you look into the pre-COVID days, these are the technological transformations which were already embedded. So in the COVID days, what happened? In the COVID days, uh, technically speaking, we didn't have the VPN connection. So that was a major jolt to us. Though all our 22,000 branches, the 60, 65,000 customer service points, the 60,000 ATMs and CDMs, all delivery channels were working nonstop without any interruption, but that is a traditional method of banking. The customers used to come to this bank, but what happened at the back end? Because COVID has already generated a lot of fear. So within a span of just one month, we could immediately in a agility manner adopt this VPN. And today in our IT ecosystem, more than 60% of my staff and if i look into the eligible officials almost all the eligible officials have got a vpn connection and 50 percent of the people are working from home at any point of time so this is the last five months more than 50 percent of my staff are working including the vendor staffs also they're working from home at any point of time so this is a phenomenal transformation and this entire it ecosystem has facilitated the traditional banking also without any problem and if you look at the business we have hardly any setback except first one or two months, two months specific. We had some level of setbacks because of the customers not coming to the branch. But in today's scenario, because we have got, as you have rightly pointed out, we have got almost 40 plus AIML models covering almost all the domains of the bank and taking into consideration all the pain points. So let us say a few models are in the area of business development. So one of the is, pre-approved personal loan. This pre-approved personal loan is being completely a digital end-to-end -end personal loan. It's a three-click loan in the Yono platform. And we have already onboarded 17 lakhs of such loans amounting to 26,000 crores. And that kind of staff productivity is enhanced. Hardly any, there is no underwriting, there is nothing. 
and there is no not fear for delinquency and the staff what they have done they have just called the customers that your name has figured for being eligible as a pre approved personal loan customer are you interested so sitting at home they simply guided the customer if at all he has not registered you know they simply guided the customer how to download and how to go through and in the process is just a three click process in the euro platform and the loan is entire thing is back ended loan is created si is also created similarly in today's sme customers also we have got a pre approved business loan that is also almost end to end digital so same thing the branch manager sitting at home simply calls a sme customer that here is the loan which is you can avail up and you just go through the you know business platform and uh, logging into the you know business again with the four click you can also avail this loan and uh, that is a beautiful uh, journey looking into the other aspects of digitalization we have got a very powerful another flagship uh, internal customer centric digital ecosystem the crm platform so you know and crm has come into the same time both are very flagship projects very highly valuable projects and this crm also through the crm the entire customer 360 d picturizations are available so sitting at the branch at home also the branch manager through his emm accessing the through the mobile or ipad or anything can just find out what are the customer linkages to us and where the possibility of marketing additional products because all this analytical leads are being pushed through the crm so at any point of time the branch people they get that what kind of products this customers can be marketed for be it a cross sell product or an off sell product or any other product so these are the activities which has been undertaken so we have hardly had any time where we faced that there is a business disruption on a larger scale looking at the government's uh, directive that you should give uh, the covid line of credit so the it ecosystem is so agile that we have given that line of credit to the extent of almost 6 lakhs loans in a span of just 20 days and that was possible because of the it ecosystem so this is in brief that the covid has given a new dimension to us especially to work from anywhere so we are not telling it is work from home work from anywhere so that is also we are propagating that even my staff which is gone was gone to bhuvneshwar and uh, got stocked up there he can also work provided he got the vpn connection so this is where we stand and this is possible because of the technological transformation which we have brought in in the last uh, decade and more specifically in the last 3 to 4 years that's that's terrific uh, maybe if i can uh, and i think this notion of work from anywhere that is very very commendable so um, maybe uh, lula if i can take a cue from the inputs that were shared by ms mahapatra how do you think ai and if you can maybe even take a little bit of a broader asia pacific uh, context or a global context how do you think ai is helping to shape the narrative in the banking industry especially in the in the wake of covid yes and deep it's always uh, very inspiring to hear anup uh, and you know i was also i had the privilege to hear some of our prior speakers you know very very content rich conversation so sandeep as uh, you know you and i are hearing in our circles right so this uh, pandemic is being touted now as the black uh, swan event in our lifetimes uh, that is going to require you know extraordinary resilience and imagination to actually survive and thrive now as anup mentioned right it was a very good example banks had always been at the forefront of adopting digital technology uh, even in the pre pandemic era right so the whole channel transformation you know uh, the the conversation around CF, crm the 360 degree view of the customer core banking modernization payments transformation they had all of this going arguably the adoption of ai uh, had been fairly selective Uh, and patchy at best at best at the fringes of process and it and there is a good reason for that right i mean when you talk about a regulated industry like healthcare or or banking uh, you know ai cannot be a, a random experiment you know uh, an isolated act of you know creating a model and putting it out there because it has got far reaching uh, consequences so you know therefore when a bank or a healthcare company starts to put out ai they have to think this through end to end right you know all the way in in our ibm balance we call it institutionalizing ai 
uh, which is basically not just the build and deploy part of it, but also you know the whole DevOps around AI, right? The sustaining of AI. And then uh, the second big thing is, you know, what is fueling that AI, right? And it brings us back to the conversation around data. Uh, now, banks are the most, arguably the most trusted guardians of personal data, right? People trust uh, the banks as custodians of their data. Now, the banks have to think through putting together a profound and a sound infrastructure, you know, before they start to dabble on that data, right? I mean, it means the whole conversation around data management, the lineage of data, the traceability, bias, so on and so forth. And also, you know, infrastructural security considerations because there is no scope for any breach there on banks. Now, having, see, having said that, um, what we are seeing and witnessing coming out of this COVID and pandemic is a, is a radical shift, a dramatic shift in that mindset an organization's appetite to embrace AI in many ways as a digital integrator between you know, virtual and, and their physical worlds. You know, when, when you can't reach your customers physically, you know, computing is able to reach them. Uh, so the major tractions that we're seeing in, in the banking industry, particularly coming out of the pandemic is around what we call as a concept of market of one, which is it's a mass personalization at scale. How do you reach your customers, you know, and giving them uh, that, uh, that, you know, the customer care and the experience, your ability to upsell, you know, you know, cross sell and stuff like that. So everything around that whole customer experience journey. The second most important thing is obviously, you know, prevention of financial crimes. You know, we, we, have, we all have seen that. Uh, and Anup, you know, I'm going to ask him a question. Uh, they have been, you know, really, really sharp at getting that done. Uh, the third area is obviously around... Uh, um, the whole productivity concept. Banks have realized that there's a lot of capital stacked in the back office and mid office, right? Where, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's been very, very labor intensive processes. So how do you use the art of automation, you know, AI enablement to do more of this straight through, whether it's customer onboarding or so on and so forth. And last but not the least, I think a lot of them are actually leveraging AI and data uh, to become something else, you know, other outside of being just a bank. So challenging the traditional models as you go forward. Um, and, and this adoption is patchy depending on, you know, which part of the world you're looking at. In Asia Pacific, a lot of AI adoption is in the areas of risk and compliance, innovation business model, customer care, and so on. In the West, we actually see a lot of the AI adoption is around, uh, drive, you know, it's, it's about the bottom line. It's driving more operational efficiencies, you know, driving more... Uh, a process streamlining using you know AI, that's that's the art of the possible. Uh, so yeah, I mean I think it's it's the adoption has picked up. It's different in different parts of the world, but everybody is very focused and concentrated around the infrastructure that needs to go hand in hand with the AI adoption. Now the best example of AI is sitting right with us here in the panel. So my question to Anup, uh, Anup, it's been it's been a privilege to be associated with you in building out the initial data warehouse, uh, and now as we are together in the journey of creating the next generation data warehouse, um, I would very much, uh, you know, uh, want you to share with the team what has been some of the thoughts uh, and an initial drive around building uh, an enterprise scale AI in the bank. And then, uh, you know, what are the challenges that people speak about data management, data governance that you have had to tackle in that journey? Yeah, thanks, Lola, uh, for this question again. Uh, right, uh, just to give a thought to this, uh, in State Bank of India, we have got a concept called Comprehensive Data Strategy for SBI. So this is a concept which we have visualized two years back. So what is the what should be the data strategy for State Bank of India? So when this thought has come, the entire top management has asked me that, yes, can you visualize the architecture of the data strategy? Then after doing a lot of research, thanks to six consultants who had also contributed during this journey, suggested a lot of thought processes also. So we have conceptualized four pillars into this data strategy. The pillar number one is data quality. The pillar number two is data infrastructure. The pillar number three is data governance. And the fourth pillar is the data analytics that means the ultimate pillar for value creation. So everybody will agree that the 
value creation through uses of advanced analytics ai ml models can never come unless as you have rightly suggested unless this data actually is in a very purified or sanitized manner and there is a robust governance which is surrounding it and that should not be any bias to this architecture that means there should not be any perceptions prejudices which are going into model development so how we can articulate all these things in holistically so the journey let us say i'll start the journey being a bank of uh, this legacy bank of 200 odd years of history so data quality continues to be the biggest pain point for the bank so we have been managing this but still we are not running over this so it will be a journey for next few years also uh, but uh, as i have been going through multiple uh, journals uh, world over i see that this is also equally the same problem in any banking industry in the world so data quality continues to be a matter of concern what is essential is how i can segregate this data for the purpose of developing powerful ai ml models that is what is the debate that we have been consistently harping on the second part is that data infrastructure thanks to ibm again and thanks to the bank some way way back in 2009 this concept of data warehouse has come into the bank and we have implemented the data warehouse of ibm one of the largest data warehouse in the globe so this data warehouse is basically capturing data sources which is basically in the nature of structured as well as semi structured data sources be it our co banking various delivery channel applications for multiple sources we have right now data being sourced to the extent of 70 plus sources with multifarious data being sourced and as because it is an etl technology the entire data is getting transformed inside the data warehouse so this transformed data is available both for the purpose of business intelligence that means we used to dashboard ourselves publish a lot of dashboards on t plus 1 basis by the time the branches are open all our dashboards are published so the decision making based on the data is now becoming a new normal earlier because of the lack of data the decisions were basically based on certain prejudices certain experiences or some thought processes of some perceptions so that is relatively now changed we are data back decision making so that has really enhanced the productivity and the quality of the decisions also then we are now facing the challenge that yes going forward also we require some level of unstructured data the regulators are demanding day in and day out if you visualize the demand from the regulators are really increasing beyond imagination the risk and fraud angles are also emanating and the ethical hackers eh, sorry the hackers normal hackers also they are also attacking the ecosystem particularly when the bank is migrating towards more and more towards the it ecosystem and the whole bank is dependent on it there are possibility of enough of threat from the cyber security angle so how can we hybridize both structured semi structured as well as the external data systems and really come up with a very powerful models for that purpose we requires an agile data warehouse so we call it as a next gen data warehouse which is nothing but a combination of three things one is the data warehouse the data lake as well as a virtualization layer which will allow us to do real time analysis on the fly so this is what is the next gen data warehouse again with the Uh, tie up with IBM. We are coming up with this platform shortly, so that will give us the bandwidth again to go for the next level of our AI ML models. But even existing scenarios, as I have told, that we have already developed 40 plus AI models. Just to give a few, besides the uh, loan products and other products recommendation engine, which is the most powerful recommendation engine, where multiple loan assets have been given as in the form of leads. But we have got powerful a uh, uh, models in the area of risk and fraud also we are detecting huge money laundering going going through our banking ecosystem we have got almost 2.5 lakhs of such networks so a lot of money laundering networks are we are also detecting the atm network of all the banks are being attacked by fraudsters but we have got a very powerful models where we are identifying these fraudsters who are claiming that the cash has not been dispensed but their accounts have been debited so we have almost arrested 30 plus people across the ecosystem in the country resulting in huge number of decline almost to the extent of 80% decline in those complaints so there has been enough contribution which has already been made i have got because i don't have the time but i have, i can say that 40 plus models each one of such model is a very value creative model 
but how that could be possible because while developing a model we focus simply one thing that let it be in house completely number 2 we have got a strong data analytics team and we have done is completely in house the purpose is that we know our pain points more than anybody else the outside world is not in a better position to assess the pain points that we are being subjected to when we have identified our pain points we completely started developing those models which are meeting to our pain points as a result our success rate of all these models is to the extent of 90% which is normally if you go into the startup ecosystem the failure rate is almost 90% but our success rate is 90% and each such model is a very value creative model so again come to the data warehouse is a very phenomenal contribution bank has taken a judicious call thanks to ibm in giving us that powerful platform also and going forward i am also visualizing the next gen pat platform also will be quite robust to give us the kind of leverage a bank which is classified as a domestically systemic important bank this is essential that we need to leap frog in the days to come so coming to the data governance the uh, third part that to derive all these things it is essential that we need to have a very powerful data governance framework again this is a concept just two years back we have institutionalized this concept and we have now one of the robust data governance framework in the banking industry maybe one of the front runners in that data governance framework we have got a chief data management officer the data governance is being driven by the chairman none other than the chairman himself so it is buying the top management views and we have got all the concepts of a single source of truth the metadata management data dictionaries the lineages the job profiles the architectural mismatches data quality issues all these things are now being attended and attacked on a multifarious manner so data quality is also being attacked through the ai models also all our ai models are coming up with lot of data quality issues so everything we are now attacking all these four pillars we are attacking consistently so with the aim that going forward my data analytics will be the most value creative platform the pillar for the bank thank you very much no i think that sorry sorry sir no, no go ahead go ahead lola no i just thought there were a number of uh, you know key points that anup uh, made which i just wanted to underscore right so this whole uh, conversation about having the foresight to start on this data journey earlier on you know being a part of that you know it it's been incredible to see the systematic progression from the data warehouse to the next gen there was a there was a question in your earlier session right data lake or not yes. so it's just a progression it's a natural progression to get prepared for this the second one the big point that you made was this whole purpose drives adoption people yes. struggle with ai adoption i think the big idea there was if your ai is modeled to solve a pain point right adoption would automatically follow and then you know as i already said data governance the institutionalization of data governance the clarity in which you guys have approached i think uh, you're right i mean it is probably you know a, a best case actually in uh, one of the one of the better cases in in the banking industry the one thing uh, anup and sandeep is interesting to know in the in, in apac in broadly in our region people have now started to venture out and talk about data sharing right which is basically taking data outside of your four walls now there are certain nonprofit ngos that you've heard of right in uh, uh, you know nonprofit organizations who are creating these platforms where multiple parties can come and have you know a data exchange and a data share um, so you can imagine they call it a data marketplace so it it in future it gives you an app, you know an opportunity to build multiple ai models on anonymized data as so obviously as you can see this can only become more pervasive if the stringency around policies etc becomes a lot more regulated etc yeah no that's terrific and and i think thank you lula for summarizing this i know we are getting very close to end of time but i i, I given the theme of the conference which is all about ai for social empowerment uh, mr mahapatra i don't think i can let you go without asking uh, one question and getting your very quick thoughts on it uh i know i know for a fact so i'm not going to raise it as a question but you are doing a lot uh as a bank uh in in our country to bridge the digital divide to further uh advance the financial inclusion um, agenda uh let me ask you one question one is uh, how do you think we can do better together as a country to drive further financial inclusion 
uh, you know, amidst some of the things which you are doing, but actually to increase um, the rural reach that we can do and how can we accomplish that, you know, through additional uses of AI. If, if you can just shed some light on that, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, Sandeep. Uh, just to give a thought on this, let me just uh, try to put for certain views that what exactly is our contribution to the financial inclusion in India. Uh, SBI cannot be thought that, uh, it's, a pivot, it's playing the pivot role for the financial inclusion. If you look into the framework of our uh, financial inclusion initiatives, we have got a dedicated financial inclusion and micro market vertical, which is headed by a deputy management director. And with a very huge network of branches being hooked into this particular vertical, focus on the entire financial inclusiveness, including the CSR responsibilities, the digital developing the digital ecosystem in the rural infrastructure as well as the semi-urban infrastructure, bringing more of uh, low ticket customers back to the digital platform. The second part is that we have got a very extensive tie up with various business co correspondents where we have got almost 65,000 customer service points across the country in mostly in the rural and semi urban areas, providing the kiosk-based kiosk -based, kiosk -based internet-based banking uh, through micro ATMs and where almost 40 plus banking services has been rendered to the customers. So this is a very cost effective model. If you look back, what is this rural ecosystem is basically the ticket size is less, be it in the liability side or the advanced side. The credit worthiness of the customers are also relatively questionable. There are a lot of informal credit. The formal credit structure is not there. The infrastructure is also not that robust. The digital ecosystem, of course, the government is giving a lot of push, but still that is yet to be developed. But what are the advantages which are now coming if you look into the Pradhan Mantri Jandan Jojana account, it's a very flagship initiative of the government. So 45 crores of custom accounts, such accounts have been already opened with a 34% market share of State Bank of India with 15.5 crore customers. If you look into the jam uh, mechanism, there, there are 1.2 billion of mobile phones, 1.2 billion of other enabled accounts. So all these have facilitated in the DBT to be actually credited to the ecosystem. So last year we have got almost 210 crores of debited transactions. So, and this year also, if you look into the prime minister's uh, Kishan Sanman Jozana, there also we have got 13.5 crores of such debited uh, transactions uh, being credited to the this PMJDY customers. So the rural infrastructure, which the government is also pushing be it in the form of roads, telecom, mobile connectivity, internet connectivity, all are fabulous. The PMJDY accounts are also come. The other enabled, uh, most of the accounts are other enabled. So how can we encase this ecosystem for the betterment of the rural economy? Everybody will agree that if the rural economy prospers, the credit worthiness of the customers will prosper, the consumption pattern will come, obviously the GDP of the country also will increase. But how to breeze that gap? Because we have got a very poor forward and backward linkages in the supply chains. The farmer to industry, industry to farmers, that supply chain, both the sides also relatively weak. Through this digital ecosystem, can we now make this entire ecosystem as robust? So what we have done in this platform is, we have now thought that there are multiple data points which are coming. I'll just give one example of a loan product. The example is the, we, the loans to the PMJY customers. The multiple data points, let us say the DBT transaction, what is the consistency of the DBT transaction? How many times the DBT transactions are getting credited? What is the thriftness of that particular customer? Whether he is increasing his uh, saving habit, whether what is his PM uh, JJBI, whether he has purchased insurance uh, like Pradhan Mantri Jeevan uh, Jyoti Bhima Jojana or Surakya Bhima Jojana, what is his UPI uses? So multiple patterns we have put, undertaken and we have adopted unsupervisory machine learning through the unsupervised machine learning, then based on the, we have had multiple clusters, then these clusters also we take took it as targets and then adopted the supervised learning because of multiple models, which we have already developed. And from that, we have now come up with almost 12 lakh uh, eligible customers who will be entitled to get loans in the range of 50,000 rupees. So that will generate a microfinance market completely at a much cheaper uh, interest rate Right now, what is happening? That's micro market is basically highly costly. The interest rates hovering from 80% to uh, 30%. So, if bank enters into this microfinance market at a much cheaper rate, let us say 10%, then 
So that will create an ecosystem. And all these loans will be completely digitized through the, our CSP channels, end-to-end -end digitized loan. So this is a very powerful model. And we have recently just done, 1st of October, we had a tie-up with HUL uh, to finance the, their retailers. So this tie-up, again, is an end-to-end digital loan, which uh, the, their retailers will be going through their Sikhar app and then come back to our Yono app. So the entire journey is again is completely digital. Up to 50,000 of loans, uh, if at all he's otherwise eligible, then he will be getting that loan. So the efforts that we have been making in making the digital ecosystem in the rural infrastructures are very robust. Plus how to ensure its adoption. We have got the financial literacy camps consistently. We have been trying to generate the literacy in the entire rural ecosystem. We have got the RCTs, the training institutes to provide skill set for the rural entrepreneurs to undertake their own entrepreneurship projects. So multiple initiatives, we have got the doorstep banking to these people and this FIM vertical, which is basically going for the uh, spearheading the CSR activity. So the, our inclusion with the society also will be quite robust. Hopefully these are the activities which you have been undertaking, maybe a path to others also to emulate and ensure that the country is totally financially included and the prosperity will be coming. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I know we are um, we are just a little over time. I just wanted to, first of all, thank everyone, but I wanted to make a few key comments. I think that we, we heard a few things which I just want to close with. Number one, from a foundational standpoint, the notion of data quality, data governance, and starting to think about our data as opposed to you know just just singularly owned data, I think is really important. The notion of permissioned access uh, and and permission sharing of data, I think, is going to become more and more important. And particularly, I think about I think everyone has said that it's not just about your organization or your industry alone. I think industry lines are blurring. We are going to be look, looking at ecosystems forming. And I think if we want to get the power of AI. Uh, that all of you are wonderfully pioneering. I think we will need to have that notion of permission data sharing that enables us to sort of create these uh, ecosystems at scale. So that's that's point number one. Second, I think some great learnings around stakeholder engagement that you talked about, having skills that have the thought process for designing these algorithms at scale, I think very, 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 very important. The notion of organizational patience celebrating quick wins and then you know scaling them up as they as they grow and and this whole notion and a call to action for principle based legislation i think that that shalini and others talked about i think is really really important and and um, I really want to sort of end with a point that uh, uh, lula made i think look adoption and acceleration is going to be the name of the game as we move forward and this notion of purpose drives adoption and having sort of an end goal in mind that we are trying to get to either as an organization or as an industry or as an ecosystem and really, you know, sort of scaling that uh, quickly uh, through the right kinds of enablers is, is I, I think, very rich conversation. Thank you, every, every single uh, member of this, of, of this team here uh, that, that shared your experiences. And uh, Vinay, uh, oh, back over to you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, Sandeep Patel, sir, for a wonderful keynote address. It was really a treat to listen to you, where you have spoken on AI-driven IT services, highlighting the importance of real-time data in decision-making and the case study, a small video which you have shown for agriculture, how to make the system bigger on scale and then working on speed also. So that was wonderful, sir. And also moderating the session so well. Uh, we could, as you have rightly summarized, we could get a lot of discussion on some of the key points uh, through the eminent panelists. Uh, I don't want to highlight, but then uh, uh, the challenges which was put forth by a uh, few of the panelists like aligning with uh, with all the people within organization that is very very important taking everybody together and then SBI uh, deputy md talking of that uh, uh, they have worked out a data governance model 
so that is also very very important while you work on that scale so you have to plan it well and ranjan talking of skill availability which definitely there was a question also uh, from the audience on that how to uh, increase the skill related to ai activities how to generate the manpower within country so that we can serve not only india but uh, the global uh, 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 businesses so sir uh, uh, thank you so much uh, definitely ai and ml and deep learning and uh, augmented intelligence which is very much needed probably for health sector are definitely going to uh, make a lot of impact on our lives and businesses uh, i would like to thank every one uh, of you all the panelists and mr sandeep patel and uh, would like to thank all the people in the audience and who are viewing this uh, so thank you one and all sir we have another session getting ready uh, on miti showcasing the ai activities the center of excellence being set up by miti so that showcasing uh, session is already on thank you so much sir thank you so much thank you everyone thank you all thank, thank you, you all. thank you all the panelists thank you